In 1852, English sculptor and natural history artist Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins was commissioned to create 33 life-size concrete models of dinosaurs to be displayed at the world-famous Crystal Palace in London. These sculptures, unlike anything the world had ever seen before, would be the first ever three-dimensional recreations of extinct animals. In 1854, Hawkins unveiled his masterpieces for all of London to see. Crowds gazed in awestruck wonder at these lifelike beasts, worlds away from any animal they had ever encountered or even imagined. The imposing Hyliosaurus, the tiny Labyrinthodons, and the enigmatic Ichthyosaur, like a portal into an era predating humanity itself, the Crystal Palace Park gave viewers one of the first and most memorable glimpses of the Age of Dinosaurs. These statues are still around today, maintained by the Friends of the Crystal Palace Park Dinosaurs, which is just about the coolest organization that anyone could ever belong to. They're still enjoyed by locals and tourists alike, though the general public's perception of these pieces has shifted dramatically. Once celebrated as the most scientifically accurate interpretations of prehistoric animals, the Crystal Palace Park dinosaurs are now only appreciated for their historical significance, rather than anything legitimately educational. What scientists, and most people, know to be true about dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals has changed a lot in the past 170 years since Hawkins first revealed these creations, and the disparate levels of artistic interpretation between modern paleo art and these is almost comical. But do their scientific inaccuracies really detract from the artistry behind the Crystal Palace Park dinosaurs? Do people dislike Jurassic Park because the velociraptors are three times bigger than they realistically should be? Would you call Primal a bad TV show because the directors decided to put a human, a T-Rex, and a killer zombie virus all in one time period? In this video, we're going to be discussing the exciting and wonderful world of paleo art. We'll discuss the impact that it's had on human culture over the years, look at specific examples of some of the most famous instances of paleo art. We're going to talk about the different kinds of paleo art, from scientific illustrations to cartoon dinosaurs. Finally, at the end of it all, we'll apply everything that we've learned and draw some paleo art of our own, answering the question once and for all, what is the right way to draw dinosaurs? We're back everyone, welcome to Subjectively. My name is Jack, and this video is the first in a new series on this channel that I'm going to be calling Observation to Concept. I got the idea to make these videos from a class I took of the same name when I was in college. In these videos, we'll investigate a certain real-world subject matter, then apply what we've learned to our artwork. At the end of each of these videos, I'll have a little homework for all of you to do. So if you're an artist or interested in becoming one, stay tuned for your first assignment. Paleo art is, within the context of human history, a relatively new niche. The term was first coined by the artist Mark Hallett in 1980. In the context of ancient geological history, that's like less than a second ago. Though we only got a snappy name for it in the past 40 years, artwork depicting prehistoric life has been around for at least two centuries. In that time, we've seen dinosaurs and other prehistoric creatures depicted in all kinds of different ways, from scientifically accurate diagrams to beautiful landscape paintings, from terrifying sci-fi abominations to adorable cartoons. There's really no right way to draw a dinosaur. This is oversimplifying things, but for the sake of digestibility, let's break paleo art down into three different categories. We're going to call this first category scientific. This includes artwork that's used to educate and inform. Artwork that you'd find in an issue of National Geographic and that reflects the current, most widely accepted understandings of paleontology. Paleo art originated from a place of scientific curiosity and as a way to help professionals in the field get a better understanding of what they were studying and how it looked and behaved in life. One of the biggest landmarks on the timeline of paleo art history and the history of paleontology as a science was an event known as the Bone Wars, or the Great Dinosaur Rush of the late 19th century. <laughs> I know how it sounds, and I really wish it was as cool as what you're imagining right now. 
basically, the Bone Wars was just a glorified pissing contest between two super rich dudes named Edward Drinker Cope and Othniel Charles March. Each dude wanted to outshine the other by discovering, and more importantly, getting credit for the discovery of as many fossil specimens as possible. As petty as the Bone Wars were at their core, the selfish actions of Cope and March actually did result in a ton of historical breakthroughs in the field of paleontology. Not only that, but their feud brought the field to the attention of the everyday American citizen. Remember, at this time, most people had never even heard the word dinosaur, let alone truly understood what it meant. The scientific process was still in its infancy, and the general public thought that dinosaurs were either biblical monsters or just elaborate hoaxes. Although, <laughs> I guess some people still think that. It was around this time that work like the Crystal Palace dinosaurs started finding its way into the conversations of the wealthy and the elite, and the dinomania only spread further from there. In the early 20th century, an artist by the name of Charles R. Knight created some of the most iconic depictions of dinosaurs that still influence subsequent paleoartists to this very day. You're probably familiar with his work, even if you don't know his name. His paintings would put the first and most potent images of dinosaurs into the minds of children and adults alike. Knight's work also falls under the umbrella of scientific paleo art, as his paintings were used as representative visuals of the most current scientific findings of the era. Knight was early to the paleo art game, so he didn't have a lot of existing media to go off of when it came to creating his artwork. In fact, the only real reference materials he had to work with were the fossils that paleontologists dug up, and of course, the then modern theories that those scientists had about what each animal looked like when it was alive. You see, if I asked you to draw me a bear, you'd probably go to Google Images and find a picture of a bear. Hell, you could find thousands of pictures of thousands of bears, as well as videos and even other artists' depictions of these animals. If that's not enough, you could get your ass into a car, drive out to Alaska, throw down a pile of fresh fish, and sketch away to your heart's content. Although, I wouldn't recommend that last method if you wanted to be able to present your sketches in one piece. The point is, it's a lot easier to draw an animal that's alive than it is to draw one that's been dead for 80 million years. A paleo artist, especially one who was drawing dinosaurs way back before almost anyone else was, needs to be able to reconstruct skin, muscle, and any other part that hasn't been preserved in stone from their mind, not from life. Not only that, but the artist's understanding of what these features might have looked like will vary depending on the current and most widely accepted theories regarding paleontology, and how much that artist is aware of said theories. Mastering this balance between art and science is the key to creating good scientific paleo art. A great example of a contemporary scientific paleo artist is Danielle Dufault. An illustrator from Toronto, Canada, Defoe is an in-house paleo artist and research assistant at the Royal Ontario Museum. Her work is stunning, but it's more than just a series of pretty paintings. These pieces are the result of direct collaboration with researchers in order to create scientific diagrams and reconstructions of their findings. It's art, yes, but it's also a huge part of the research process for paleontologists. Defoe has a degree from the Technical and Scientific Illustration program at Sheridan College, but you don't have to be a college graduate to make beautiful, scientifically accurate paleo art. Let's try to follow in Danielle's footsteps and make a scientific piece of paleo art of our own. For this approach to making paleo art, we're going to have to use our brains a little bit. And you know what that means. It's time for a paleontology lesson. Almost all dinosaur fossils are composed exclusively of bone, or rather imprints of bones preserved in stone, with very little soft tissue ever being preserved. A fossil is not a piece of organic matter that's been preserved for millions of years. Think of fossils as more like casted molds, wherein organic material, like bone, makes an impression in soft sediment. This impression, under very specific conditions, will remain long after the bone and all other organic material has decomposed. Then, the impression left in the sediment will fill up with other kinds of stone, and one, two, three, you have yourself a fossil. Now, we as paleo artists are going to take these bones, and we're going to put together a little puzzle. Let's assume that we have a fully reconstructed skeleton, which, for the record, is extremely rare and almost never happens. In fact, 
Complete or nearly complete fossils are so unusual that when they are discovered, they make headlines across the world. It's because of this notoriety that some dinosaurs are more popular than others, as the general public is made aware of their discovery. Incidentally, this is part of why T. rex is the animal most associated with the field of paleontology. Taking this fossil, an artist like Daniel Defoe would apply just a little bit of scientific knowledge, referencing the anatomical structure of living animals to get an idea of things like muscle, skin, and other features that weren't preserved in the fossil. We may not know with 100% accuracy what a Tyrannosaurus's musculature actually looked like, but we can take some pretty well-informed guesses based on other animals that it is either directly related to or that have similar physical features. The T-Rex is actually what modern scientists call an avian dinosaur, or more simply, a bird. We have a lot of different birds around today, though they all look somewhat different from their Mesozoic ancestors. Nonetheless, we can use some of their anatomy to help us inform T-Rex's musculature. Remember though, T-Rex was a lot bigger than the average extant bird, so we have to take into consideration adaptations that much larger animals use to support their own weight on dry land. While there aren't really any living animals quite like the extinct avian dinosaurs, barring of course living avian dinosaurs, the basic laws of physics that allowed T-Rex to walk can be seen on full display in animals like rhinos, elephants, and even the largest living dinosaurs that still walk the earth today, like ostriches and emus. Part of this analysis of weight distribution includes figuring out how T-Rex actually stands. Most people these days are familiar with the modern visualization of the animal, where it stands horizontally with its spine parallel to the ground. This is a relatively new theory in the context of paleontology, and you'll see animals like T-Rex standing straight up and down like Godzilla in older paleo art. Knowing what we know about paleontology and the anatomy of these animals, we can pose our T-Rex in a scientifically accurate way. Okay, this looks like a pretty believable musculature structure. I think Danielle Defoe would probably have a few notes for me, but for someone who very infrequently draws scientifically accurate anatomical structures, I'll give myself about a B. Fortunately for me, I can avoid the harassment of super paleo nerds in the comments by checking my work, so to speak, against other state-of-the-art paleo artists to make sure that my interpretation is up to snuff with what paleontologists would consider to be scientifically accurate before I move on to adding skin and scales. Artists like Charles Knight did not have this luxury though, and it is partly due to this and partly due to the progress made in the field of paleontology that we can now point at his work and laugh, for he has committed the greatest sin in the world of paleo art, skin wrapping. Okay, wait, hold, stop harassing poor Chuck here. He didn't know any better. Look, if all you had to work off of when drawing an animal was its bones, don't you think that you might make it look a little anemic? I'll be the first to admit it. I used to draw dinosaurs like this all the time when I was a kid. Chances are, if you drew dinosaurs when you were younger, you probably did too, without really knowing what it means or that it was even a thing. It's also the number one thing that people like to point to as the wrong way to draw dinosaurs. You know, in some senses, they're right. Skin wrapping is a term that paleo artists use to describe art of dinosaurs that ignores anatomical features such as fat, fur, or feathers. Features that, although they might not have always been preserved in the fossil, were almost certainly present on the animal while it was still alive. Instead of including these features, paleo art that skin wraps simply depicts an animal that is mostly skin and bone. A lot of the skeleton protrudes in awkward spots, and things like fenestrae in the skull are way more prominent than what was realistic. Part of why artists depict prehistoric animals like this is because it makes them look more frightening. It can be intentional, but in older paleo art, it was simply what scientists accepted as the most realistic way to imagine dinosaurs. To give you a good idea of how ridiculous this kind of artwork looks to professional paleontologists, let me show you some examples of animals that you may, or may not, recognize if they were drawn in the same style that skin-wrapping paleo artists depict dinosaurs in. This is a swan. Well, a swan without feathers, or enough muscles, and one with widely speculative uses for what those long fingers must have been used for. This is a baboon. Surely, if you dug up a skeleton that looked like this, you too would assume that it was completely hairless, with fully exposed teeth and no ears, nose, or lips. How about this hippo? 
The spurs on its lower jaw must have been some sort of defensive adaptation, right? Like an extra set of horns that just jut out to ward off predators. These illustrations were done by C.M. Kozman, a paleo artist with a mission to convince the world that dinosaurs deserve to be depicted like real animals, not malformed alien monsters. This is a valid perspective, and it's coming from a place of passion for the scientific aspects of paleo art and a desire to educate. His admirable efforts to change the way we see dinosaurs has not fallen on deaf ears. We will ensure that, as we add in the real meat of our T-Rex to this illustration, we consider all parts of the animal, even if that means making her a little chunky. Hey, more to love. This is a pretty looking Rex, and she's almost done. We're just missing one final thing. Color. This is the fun part, because even for a professional paleontologist, the color of extinct animals is almost entirely speculative. Realistically, there are a few things we can roll out. T-Rex probably wasn't hot pink with bright green stripes. The try-hard scout paint job, if you will. We can make an educated guess about what color dinosaurs were based on extant species that fill similar roles in the ecosystem and that live in similar environments. Since we know that T-Rex lived in lush, rich forests and filled the role of apex predator, we can safely assume that its hide would consist of greens, browns, and reds to help it blend in with its environment. A paleo nerd will certainly correct me in the comments, but I believe recent findings of Tyrannosaurus skin imprints have all but confirmed that they were majoritively reddish brown. However, we can consider things like sexual dimorphism, subspecies and mutations, as well as any number of other factors that might have had an impact on what colors T-Rex was and on which parts of the body these colors appeared. It can be a lot of fun to speculate about things like colors on prehistoric animals, and more so than almost any other feature of a dinosaur's anatomy, you can argue that your particular paint job for T-Rex was plausible, even if a grouchy nerd challenges you on it. Me, I'm partial to a very woodsy color theme. I like to think of T-Rex like a prehistoric brown bear, the embodiment of northern boreal wildlife. I imagine it sporting all the colors you'd see in northern US and Canada greens, reds, and browns. And by the way, if you like the brushes that you see me using here, consider visiting our Gumroad and purchasing them for yourself. These were made by Claire, and I use them in almost all of my work. We have brush packs for painting, sketching, and even a specific set for drawing Fakemon. At the end of the day, there's always going to be room for adjustments in a scientific work of paleo art. Different people will have different theories and opinions about your reconstruction, and there's a good chance that in 15 years, your once infallible rendition of paleontological brilliance will be laughed off the museum wall and replaced with a brand new theory. Nonetheless, this marriage of art and natural history creates a beautiful niche of imaginative worlds that would have otherwise been lost to the annals of time. Hey guys! Before we move on to the next subgenre of paleo art, I want to take a quick moment to talk about something important. If you've been following our channel for the last few years, you'll know that videos like this are kind of new for us. Subjectively is in an experimental stage right now where we're branching out to new topics and making content that we had once considered to be too risky to dedicate time to. This means that revenue from these videos fluctuates a lot as we try to figure out which subjects perform well and which videos you guys want to see more of. Subjectively is our livelihood, but it's also our passion. We want to keep doing this for a living, but especially in times like this, it can be hard to make ends meet. That's why I want to take a moment to thank our incredibly devoted Patreon supporters. <laughs> the name is so appropriate. These guys are to us as the wealthy patrons of the Renaissance were to full-time artists. They give us a generous infusion of their hard-earned cash, and in return, we're able to spend our time making art for all of you to enjoy. I really can't express how much it means to me and Claire that you guys enjoy what we do so much to support us in this way. If you'd like to join the ranks of these benevolent benefactors, consider supporting us on Patreon. Not only will your contributions help us make more videos, but we also have other amazing perks like stickers, prints, and even character design lessons exclusive to our Patreon members. Sorry to have sidetracked right in the middle of that video, but I really do appreciate you guys who sat through that little spiel. And thank you once again to all of you who have been supporting us through these years. It really means a lot. Let's go back to our little diagram here. You may have noticed that it is of the Venn variety. In sharp contrast to a lot of the decisions I make in life, this one was done for a reason. 
I wanted to simplify the vast spectrum of this genre, but the fact of the matter is is that there's going to be overlap between what we're calling the three categories of paleo art. We're moving from scientific to fantasy, a category defined by the use of artistic liberties to depict dinosaurs as representations of intangible themes, rather than literal animals. On our way from one category to another, let's take a look at where these two circles overlap. One of the most famous contemporary paleo artists, who am I kidding, arguably the most famous paleo artist of all time, James Gurney, is a master at taking ancient rocks and turning them into stunning works of painterly brilliance. You probably recognize his work from Dinotopia. No, not this Dinotopia. I don't want to talk about this Dinotopia. This Dinotopia, the book series that inspired that cringeworthy Hallmark TV series. Gurney is not just an icon within the paleo art community, his artwork is an inspiration for illustrators of all kinds. Following in the footsteps of illustrators like Norman Rockwell and J.C. Leyendecker, James Gurney is known for his realism style paintings, a style that relies heavily on strong reference and lots of practice. Unlike the grandfathers of this contemporary style of illustration, however, Gurney prefers to illustrate subject matter that's not so easily referenced. Not only does he illustrate dinosaurs with levels of intricacy so precise that it would make a paleo nerd swoon, but he sets these animals in entirely fantastical settings that don't exist today and never existed at all. He's coined the term imaginative realism to describe his work, taking what we understand about the real world and how we visualize it and applying that to subject matter that we can't actually see. It's because of these artistic liberties taken with paleo art that I place Gurney's work somewhere between fantasy and scientific. His approach to recreating prehistoric animals is very much in line with that of artists like Danielle Defoe, who use real findings and modern theories to inform their work. However, he doesn't stop at painting a realistic dinosaur. He takes it a step further by setting these animals in a fantasy world, with layers upon layers of creativity applied to take his work from interesting to transportative. An example of something more firmly in the fantasy category of paleo art would be the film series Jurassic Park. Thus far, we've only discussed paleo art within the context of 2D illustrations and 3D sculpture, but film is very much another medium through which artists can depict prehistoric life. The novel by Michael Creighton was inspired by the science of paleontology, and more so by the science of genealogy. Of course, it's also a story about mankind's hubris, about how despite our best efforts to control it, nature is a force that cannot be tamed. Steven Spielberg, advised by paleontologist Jack Horner and armed with a team of talented concept artists, storyboarders, set painters, and practical effects experts, created dinosaur designs that prioritized symbolizing these themes rather than creating something that was 100% scientifically accurate. Sure, that one annoying kid at school will love to tell you how a velociraptor is actually not much larger than a chicken, covered in feathers, and as capable of opening a metal door as the average chihuahua. But would this scene have become as iconic if any of that was true in the movie? Sometimes, artistic liberties are taken for the sake of entertainment, to push the theme of a story rather than to conform to the laws of science, even if it means making a few nerds angry. I'd include artwork from series like Magic the Gathering in this context as well, such as this piece by Anna Podidwarna from the Lost Caverns of Ixalan set. Once again, these dinosaurs don't represent any real animal that ever existed, but they do symbolize the wild, untamable beauty and might of the plain of Ixalan. Dinosaurs are often used in works of fiction to embody intangible themes. Mystery, power, nature, danger, fear, curiosity, and so on. If you're writing a story about any or all of these themes, including paleo art in the visuals of your world, may do you wonders. Prehistoric life as a subject matter has captivated the attention of audiences for generations. There's just something so engaging about it, even when it's not depicted in a way that's scientifically accurate. Think back to your childhood. If you or anyone you knew as a kid had a t-shirt or a lunchbox or a backpack or a toy that was dinosaur themed, please raise your hand. Okay, I can't see your hands, but just hit the like button instead. Either way, I'm guessing that almost all of you, even if your interest in the subject has waned, 
enjoyed the mysterious and intriguing concept of dinosaurs throughout the course of your childhood. Now, let's tap into that childlike fascination with the prehistoric world and create some fantasy-style paleo art. I called this subgenre fantasy, but that doesn't exclude depictions of dinosaurs existing in science fiction. Maybe you'd like your fantasy dinosaur to have mounted on it some giant laser guns. I mean, who wouldn't? There's a lot of room for creative license in the fantasy style of paleo art. It could be as simple as making a velociraptor a lot bigger and skin wrapping it so that it appears more scary. You could also take elements of several similar dinosaurs and exaggerate them to create something almost lifelike, but still unlike any real animal. Your work could be more of a suggestion of a real dinosaur rather than trying to be one specific species. Or maybe you get real wild with it, using what we know about real anatomy to create something impossible yet informed. We learned about how bone connects to muscle, how skin falls over fat, how weight can be supported even when the animal is enormous. Take this information and use it to create something unlike anyone has ever seen before. Reference scientific paleoart, examine living animals, study a bird in real life, and take note of all of the little details. Most importantly, create something that fits the role that you need to cast in your fictional world. Whether it's a symbol of nature or the hubris of mankind, or maybe you just want to draw something cool for the sake of drawing something cool. Me, I'm going to indulge my favorite fantasies. Armored women, sea monsters, and of course, dinosaurs. I should say, at this point, that while I've been focusing on dinosaurs specifically, there are many other different kinds of prehistoric animals that you could be depicting here. Dinosaurs are the most popular, but animals like pterosaurs, plesiosaurs, and extinct mammals, fish, and bugs are all amazing options to consider here. In fact, since I am no longer confined by the laws of science, I can take liberties with my dinosaur by merging features of several different prehistoric animals together. No animal like this has ever existed, and I'm sure most people even slightly educated in paleontology would be offended if I called it a dinosaur. Look, a water dinosaur! Quick, try to make it to shore! However, those critics have no power over me here. Anatomy, behaviors, colors, laws of physics, these petty restraints shatter and fall to my feet, and I am free. My seafaring warrior woman stands beside her monstrous mount, some hybrid of a sauropod, a plesiosaur, and a prehistoric crocodile. That water dinosaur should take care of those two. And while I don't ignore the knowledge I've gained from studying real animals, I do bend the rules to create something altogether impossible, in the best way. Paleontology is a science, but dinosaurs are so much more than data and logic. They represent the mystery of our ever-changing planet and the haunting promise of extinction. They are legends, they are myths, they are real, but they exist only as we choose to let them. If we are not allowed to take liberties with our paleo art, then are we truly enjoying the subject to its fullest extent? Surely, limiting an artist's creativity is the only wrong way to draw dinosaurs. We're not done yet, though. Not quite yet. There is one more style of paleo art to explore before we decide what the right way to draw dinosaurs is. So far, we've seen scientific and fantasy, and I sort of struggled to find the most appropriate moniker for this final circle of our Paleo Venn diagram. I decided, after much deliberation and frustration, to settle on the label cartoon. I kind of hate myself for using this term because I, I find that people use it derogatorily to describe something unexcitedly simple and childlike. However, we will reclaim this word today, and instead use it as the name of a subgenre of paleoart that includes such beloved classics as Land Before Time, Ice Age, and uh, The Good Dinosaur by default, I guess. I wish this movie was just a little bit better. In this category, I would also include depictions of prehistoric creatures that really only borrow from the subject in the most basic of ways. Barney is technically a dinosaur, but one from our imagination, so he looks about as much like any dinosaur as a Roblox character does a real human. Similarly, you've got shows like Dinosaur Train, which is a children's TV show that, like Barney, helps young children develop healthy social skills. These kinds of paleo art are less about actual dinosaurs and more about the effect that they have on younger audiences. They simplify the subject matter down to shapes and colors, geometric suggestions of the real animals with excitement and entertainment as their primary goal. 
Land Before Time, the iconic Don Bluth film written by Judy Frudberg and Tony Geis, is not really a story about dinosaurs. It's a story about growing up and facing adversity as the cruelty of the world around us replaces our childlike innocence with survival instincts. It's about embracing our differences and appreciating others for what makes them unique, rather than forcing everyone to conform. Really, the story could have been told in any number of ways. The characters could have been dogs or aliens set in a hostile, dangerous world. The characters could have even been human children of different backgrounds and cultures, learning tolerance through their shared hardships. The choice to make the setting of The Land Before Time a prehistoric Earth was actually partially the idea of Steven Spielberg, who was an executive producer of the film. Apparently, Bluth and Spielberg simply wanted to make a film about dinosaurs, and brought on writers Judy Frudberg and Tony Geis to write the script. The two were, at the time, writing for Sesame Street, and their experience writing for children's TV shines through clearly in the final film. Also, George Lucas got his name on this. I, I guess just he and his buddy Steve were chatting about children's movies and dinosaurs, and he just had to be a part of it. Anyway, like so many stories, dinosaurs were selected as the primary visual motif mainly for their inherent mass appeal. The plot was built up around these visuals, and inspiration came from older animated dinosaur films like the Rite of Spring sequence from Disney's Fantasia. The ensemble of characters represent real-world themes, caricatured dramatizations of struggles a lot of children experience in their own lives. Though these themes may be hard for children to confront, disguising them as cartoon dinosaurs keeps young audiences engaged, as long as you weren't as afraid of this movie as I was when I was five. Not all examples of cartoon paleo art are geared exclusively towards younger audiences. Take Jendi Tartakovsky's Adult Swim animated series Primal. Nothing about this show is kid-friendly, nor is any of it scientifically accurate, though I would still consider it to be a work of brilliant and culturally significant paleo art. Here, as in Land Before Time, dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals are used as a visual metaphor for real-world themes relevant in the modern day. Because of this, science is exchanged for artistic stylization. The animals in the show act more like human characters than any believable prehistoric organism. Their anatomies are unrealistic, and this kind of stylization not only makes them easier to animate, but also allows for the characters to emote in ways that real animals may not be able to. Some of them are even skin-wrapped, a sin in most circles of dinosaur enjoyers, but a brilliant choice in this context. As we discussed before, this method of stylization makes animals seem a lot more scary, which is exactly what the animators and character designers needed them to be in this show. In short, it's not scientifically accurate, but it certainly isn't the wrong way to draw dinosaurs. You've also got the classic children's book series, How Do Dinosaurs Say Goodnight, written by Jane Yolen and illustrated by Mark Teague. These cartoon dinosaurs are not here to educate six-year-olds about the most recent breakthroughs in the field of paleontology. They're not here to terrify a crowd of anxious moviegoers. However, I'm tempted to put the artwork of Mark Teague somewhere in the middle of this Venn diagram, comfortably embodying the element of each of our three categories. There is a level of understanding in regards to dinosaur anatomy that exceeds that of something like Barney, but it's not so restricting that it prevents an ankylosaurus from jumping on the bed. Teague meets in the middle between believable weight, texture, and movement, and impossible imaginings. There is, of course, a fantasy element here as well. I don't think I need to explain it all that much, but most scientists agree that gigantic carnivorous theropods did not live in three-bedroom American suburban homes with human parents and a stuffed animal to help them fall asleep. Here, dinosaurs take the place of human children, embodying the chaos and willfulness of young kids from the perspective of their parents. And, of course, they are very cartoony. Exaggerated physical features and saturated colors to catch the eye of young audiences as they lie in bed with whoever is reading them to sleep. These books were some of my favorites when I was little. I loved how each page hid the name of the dinosaur featured in the scene somewhere in the artwork and how each specific animal was informed enough that it didn't look like a big purple marshmallow. The artwork preserved the natural beauty of the real animals while stylizing them to better fit into their fantasy world. And unlike so many pieces of artwork depicting dinosaurs, these books made the creatures feel friendly and lovable. For this, my final piece of paleo art, 
I want to channel the emotions that I felt as a child while my mom read these books. I'm not thinking about accuracy or drama. My only goal is to have whoever looks at this artwork to feel like a kid again, to feel safe under your covers while your creative little mind races with thoughts of a magical prehistoric world. Dinosaurs were my childhood, but they're also a huge part of my adulthood, too. Recently, my wife and I got way too invested in a game called Path of Titans, a PvP survival MMO where you play as dinosaurs. Though the game itself was a little dry, we really enjoyed reliving that thrill of pretending that you're a dinosaur, running around in an imaginary prehistoric world and exploring all of its dangers and beauties. In my cartoon piece, I'm not only channeling the feelings I remember from my childhood, but also the more recent memories of love and enjoyment that I experienced as an adult. I can pick any colors I like, take liberties that help the dinosaurs embody the emotions I'm feeling as I draw. This is the beauty of the cartoon style. We're artists at the end of the day. We can learn about a subject and all of its delicate intricacies, but we don't have to stop at the limits of human understanding. We can take it further than what simply is or isn't possible. We depict our feelings as much as we do information, sometimes even more so. If you have an emotional attachment to a subject, and everyone has at least one, express that through your art. It may sound overly sentimental, but I think people need to be reminded that art isn't just about the finished product. It's about the process that you take to get there. And yes, that applies to silly little drawings of dinosaurs, too. So here we are at the end of our Jurassic journey, if you will. We have three pieces of artwork, each one a representation of the three subgenres of paleo art, the scientific, the fantastic, and the cartoonish. But which one is the right way to draw dinosaurs? If you've watched all the way through to the end, I think you already know the answer. There is no right way to draw dinosaurs, no one thing to point to and say that is done incorrectly. Like with all art, the only thing that really matters is an artist's intent. Are you trying to depict a prehistoric animal that reflects the most up-to-date scientific findings in the field? If so, then the science category should be your focus. Looking to transport your viewer to a world of imagination and excitement? The subgenre of fantasy paleo art is for you. And if you just want to goof off, create something fun that could be enjoyed by anyone, then indulge in cartoon dinosaurs. Of course, you can also mix and match and overlap all of these categories. Hell, you could even make up your own. As long as the themes in your head convey through your art and are interpreted by your audience, you've drawn dinosaurs right. Now, as I promised at the beginning of this video, I have a little homework for all of you. Don't worry, it's fun homework. <laughs> if only all of my homework in grade school was drawing dinosaurs, I would have had the best grades in the state. I want everyone who's willing to pick up one of these three categories, science, fantasy, or cartoon, and illustrate your favorite dinosaur in that style. Remember to consider your intent with these pieces. If you chose cartoon, I want your dinosaur to convey something to me, something abstract or emotional or both. If you go with science, feel free to innovate, maybe even dip your toes into the speculative side of paleontology, illustrating less popular theories in a way that's educated and informed. Submit your finished piece to the Observation and Concept channel of our Discord. The link is in the description. In our next Observation to Concept video, we'll showcase our favorite pieces from this assignment. Be sure to give yourself proper credit on your submission, a watermark or a signature with your name or social media so that other people can find you and your work. I hope you all enjoyed this departure from our regular videos. If you're new here and you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave us a like and subscribe so we know to make more content like this. It's been a thrill as always, and I can't wait to see you all in the next video.